Yeah, I remember an experiment about uh, priming, a very old experiment. Uh, it was called, uh, it had a, a very funny name, something I had to win a trivia pursuit game. Uh, they had uh, the two groups of uh, young people and they would flash the image of Albert Einstein to one group and when the image of a group of hippies to another, to the other experimental group That's and right. then they would make them play trivia pursuit. And so they, they found out that the, the results were significantly higher for the people who saw Einstein, which was right. kind of cool, actually. I really love that. Um, That's right. And it's not the case that those people would go and buy an Einstein poster. Yeah, right? exactly. So, so the, 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 the way that it, it's, it activates an idea, it's not necessarily activating a particular uh, purchase. Uh, intention. So, so it works. It works quite differently. And by the way, some companies are getting back to it now in in a small way. Really? What what way? So, for example, there's companies who are thinking about the sequences of ads. Oh yeah. Right. Because if you think about it, you can say ads are separate, and every time you start a new ad, your brain starts from something empty. Well, that's not the case. Priming tells you that whatever you had a thought from before stays with you for a little longer and colors what, what you're going to see next, how are you going to think about ads in a similar way? When you understand that the ad that came before you could either make your ad look better or worse, more appealing, less appealing, and so on. Yeah, there, were, uh, there was another very nice experiment about uh, creative work and the sense of guilt in cognitive dissonance, actually, and they, they really implemented that in ads. They, they put a, uh, an ad that implicated something creative, and then they uh, sent the uh, the ad for you know uh, fundraising for I yes. don't know, something. So that kind of actually worked, yep. I think, at least here in Italy. Um, I think that's very interesting. Actually, you know, uh, cross cultural research and um, transcultural results are fascinating. In my opinion, you know, uh, there are so many differences, like very small differences, in how people in Europe see things and how people in America see things. And I can't even imagine how big the differences are for Asia. But you know, there's one example that I found interesting. Uh, Starbucks again. You know, they um, have a very nice design team, which studies exactly the architectural structure and style of uh, the country they're going to open a new store in. And they build and design the store to completely blend in um, the style uh, around them. So stores aren't the same, like McDonald's for example, they're all the same in the world, but they're actually, you know, um, with the same uh, kind of patterns, colors that are typical of the country they're in. How do you think that's uh, that's going to impact the customer? How do you think that's it's, is it good or or not? Yeah. So so first of all, let me say something general about cultural differences. When we ask the question about cultural differences, we should ask ourselves whether people are different inherently or whether the culture just gets them to express something differently. So think about something like self-control. Self-control is the problem that we want something for the short term and it's different than what we want in the long term. And most of human tragedies come from that thing. Right? In the short term you want some good tiramisu, in the long term you want to be on a diet. In the short term you want to be a uh, to watch a video in the long term you want to exercise. Saving, all of those things are like that. Now, if you look for example at cultural differences and look at what happened in Japan after the tsunami, the Japanese have just worked in an impressive way. You looked at how the people were standing in line, waiting in order, there were no riots. I mean, can you imagine this happening in Italy? No. How would people behave, right? So, so it really is incredible. And you also look at the saving rates of the Japanese. They look, they look really impressive. And you might come to the conclusion that saying the Japanese are a race that has an incredible self-control ability. But at the same time, I don't, have you been to Japan? No, unfortunately. I wish okay. I had. So at the same time you go to a bar in Japan and all of a sudden they don't look like people with very good self-control. <laughs> 
right? So you can ask yourself whether, and you know, I haven't studied this particular question, but you can ask yourself whether the Japanese have a high self-control in general, which I don't think is the answer, or is it the case that there's a few aspects of their lives where the rules of the culture are overriding the individual tendencies? And my, my personal belief is that people are basically very, very similar at the core. You know, our genetic structure, our brain structure is just incredibly, incredibly, incredibly similar. The variance is very large. But what culture does is culture is like a veneer that sits on top of our personality and gets us to express our individuality differently. So we are all the same and culture gets this the sameness to be expressed in different way. We stand in line, we don't stand in line. We use more hand motions when we talk, we use less hand motions than when we talk. Now in terms of your questions about Starbucks, I think this is a slightly different question, which is the question of comfort. And this is a question of over time, when we get used to a certain cues and you get used to a certain level of aesthetics, uh, do you acquire aesthetics through culture and through experience? And I think the answer is definitely yes. And you can, of course, just look at art and look at over in, uh, in art over the years, how what is aesthetic has changed over the years. <clears throat> so some things have never changed. Uh, big eyes have always been beautiful, uh, symmetry, uh, no blemishes. I mean, there's some biological things about beauty, about human beauty that have always remained the same in terms of what we appreciate. Other things have changed. Uh, we used to worship the men's body, now we worship women's bodies. And we used to uh, worship people who are a little chubbier, now we worship people who are uh, <clears throat> very, very skinny. So, so those, there's some basic things that are biological about reproduction, and then there's some other things that are more cultural. So in terms of the Starbucks perspective, I think they do need to understand what is aesthetics in that culture. There's some general things about aesthetics, but then there's some cultural things about aesthetics that people have learned through the years, and I think they could create a more inviting, comfortable environment if we, they understood what people in those cases view as aesthetic. Yeah, you know, I've, I've had a, an idea for the last couple of months that kept coming to my head, but I, I don't know if it's really right. You know, uh, I was thinking that um, the similarities, the way we are all similar, so those aspects that are being studied by uh, neuroscientists, to be clear, and the ones that are on top, like the cultural layer you were talking about, you know, I, I was, I don't know why, but it, in my head they were uh, very similar to the differences in the Pollinger model, you know, the temper temperament and character differences. So. The, the aspects of temperament that are equal for all of us, you know, that are um, inherently ours, and the character which actually builds upon the temperament. I don't know if that's really right, actually. What do yeah. you think? <clears throat> so, you know, I think that uh, if you think about human beings, we are attuned to seeing differences, right? Think about it. You're, you have a brain that wants to notice dissimilarity between people rather than similarities. If you notice similarities, you wouldn't be very useful, right? So <clears throat> I remember the first time I went to China, I thought all the Chinese looked the same. I, you know, I could differentiate very, very few Chinese. And I traveled with a friend who has curly hair and he has brown eyes, I had blue eyes. We, we looked very different, but we would show each other's passports. And they, they would have no clue in hotels. They would look at the passport, they would look at him, and they would have no idea that we switched the, the issues. And the fact is that, you know, uh, I think that's, that's kind of true of the world. Like, the true approach of viewing Westerners was the, these Chinese people. This was before China was open. That they could not determine the differences. If, if somebody came from outer space and they looked at us, I assure you they would not know the differences. It would make, you would need like really long hair, really short hair to, to make a difference. Maybe glasses would work, but mostly they wouldn't know the differences. Now, for us, for our brain, it's incredibly important 
to notice the differences. So we develop this heightened sensitivity to differences between people. And I think this is why we also exaggerate the importance of individual differences and cultural differences. Like if you had 100% of human behavior and you say how much of it is attributed to human nature and how much of it is attributed to culture, I think most people would think that culture plays a big role, but in fact it plays a very little role. And I think, again, the difference is you, you see people being different. You see men and women, old and young, you see all these nuances and you say it must be connected to some behavior. The reality is that we just are not observing the similarity to the same degree. It's harder for us to observe that. But I think if we did, and, and I hope we will, do more established global studies, we would find much more similarity. I think that would be very, very interesting, actually. Um, you know, to, to really work with this kind of, um, of research. Yeah. Um, so I have another question, um, which is the following. What do you think is the factor that brings a lot of people, many, very many people, to try anything um, companies like uh, Apple offer? Anytime Apple, for example, has a new product, whatever it is, there are so many people who are, uh, uh, who are going to buy it, and um, not, not, even, not even thinking if they're going to need it, actually. So what do you think is, is the factor that brings people to do that? So, uh, just as a... Yeah, I have one too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm one of those people. Um, for me, it's uh, the jaw, the cleverness, right? Uh, they, they do things that surprise me with their cleverness every time, and I'm willing to pay a premium to experience this cleverness. So the touch screen, for example, you know, this, if you say, you know, what, how valuable is this motion? <laughs> and how valuable is this motion, right? It doesn't seem like you're inherently very useful thing that I would pay hundreds of dollars for this ability to do that. But the truth is, it's really quite fun when you, when you do it. Uh, for me, the, the, the biggest toy uh, I own is a Segway. And okay. every time I get on my Segway, I, am, I marvel by Dean Kamen's genius. You know, I, I also have one of these balancing boards when you stand on it and you try to balance yourself. And when you do it, you realize how difficult it is to balance yourself. But all of a sudden, there's a computer there, a set of computers that is balancing me without me doing the job. And, it's, and then you just lean forward, you go forward, you lean backward, you go backward. It really kind of feels like somebody have thought very carefully about what's natural for human beings and it's really kind of delightful. Uh, so so I, I marvel with the thinking that goes into it. I say somebody has thought about this particular question very hard and they came up with something that looks like it's incredibly intuitive and that's exactly the way I would expect it to happen. And you know, again, we can link it to the cross-cultural differences. It's amazing, right? They come up with an interface that works for people in, in every place, right? It's not that it's just Italian or just American or just Japanese. Yeah, 